Hi, I'm Meg Riley. Today I'm in Boston, Massachusetts for the CLF board meeting, and you've joined us for another episode of The View. Let's start by having our regulars say hello. Asia Hauser, how are you? Hi, I, I am doing well. I'm in Seattle today, uh, and I'm starting some traveling again starting this evening um, for the next, uh, it feels like it's going to be eight weeks, but it's not quite that much, but I'm going to many places over the next few weeks. And I'm doing well. It's sunny in Seattle. Woohoo. Michael, how are you? I'm great. Thanks, Asia. This is Michael Tino joining you from Peekskill, New York. It's a beautiful end of summer, beginning of fall day here. And uh, yes, the sun and the blue skies and the crisp air, uh, Eli, all the things that are happening elsewhere in the world. So it's good to be with you all. And on tech, we have Lori Stone Sertoski standing in for Jessica Star Rockers, who is seeing the MFC. We'll just remind you to send her good energy. Lori, what time is it where you are? Uh, it is a crisp 8 a.m. Uh, me and uh, actually, the majority of us are out on the uh, West Coast today. So I'm glad to be here. And I'll be disappearing behind the, the chalice. And do you want to share all the places you'll be so people know how to be in touch with us? Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, this weekend, I'll be in San Diego at Palomar UU Fellowship. Oh, I'm sorry. You meant on The View. <laughs> well, that was interesting, too. I mean, I did mean on The View, but I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Lori's touring. This is Lori's fall tour uh and this is where you can find her that's awesome. we were starting <laughs> yes that was that was a context mistake sorry uh, <laughs> it, was, it was a fair our, mistake our page why don't you finish page. while you'll be in palomar since you told everyone you'd be there just say why and then move oh, on sure. <laughs> it'll be a very smooth transition no one will notice <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm going to be there for a weekend uh, a work a workshop that will be the weekend at the the congregation there. Uh, we're Allies for Racial Equity is doing a, a workshop on um, tools, tips, tricks, uh, tactics for dismantling white supremacy in your congregation. So we're going to be holding down the fort there with the fine folks at Palomar and looking forward to it. For the view. <laughs> I will be on Facebook and Twitter, uh, and you can find us uh, live in the comments uh, uh, under the video, uh, and you can always find that at our Facebook event for this event, and then on Twitter as well. I'm getting ready to post our, our video link there. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Christina Rivera is in Washington, D.C. today, witnessing the events that are um, utmost on a lot of our minds. We are here instead of listening to the travesty being called a hearing, um, which is basically, in my opinion, an assault being called a hearing, which I have no interest in witnessing, though I'm sure I will watch it in pieces later with help. Um, CLF will be holding a vigil online this afternoon, 1.30 Eastern time. Um, I guess that's this morning Western time. We want people to gather find each other, see one another's faces, pray together, find strength uh, in all of the courage that is being shown by women and people of other genders who are speaking out. But meanwhile, and not unrelated, I'm very excited that today with us, we have Jay Lynn, Reverend Jay Lynn Scott, right? And That's she right. is also out in Seattle, right? You're also another very I early am. morning riser. <laughs> I am in Edmonds. It's 8.06. We're doing okay. <laughs> no, we're doing fine. And Reverend Jay Lynn is a Buddhist community minister. She has been the director of religious education in three UU congregations. She's a speaker and preacher and meditation instructor. And we were joking before we went online that maybe just meditating this morning might be helpful to all of us. But we're also really excited to talk to her because she's really been focusing on faith development um, for trans folks and, and how identities can really shape what faith development looks like. So she teaches transgender theology, queer faith, and comparative spiritual practices. So welcome, Jaylin. I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. It's so nice to be here with you. I hardly know where to begin. So 
so you you were a religious educator, so you were looking at how faith development worked for everyone, I assume, and then you started to notice some patterns emerging among the transgender community. Is that how that happened for you, or why don't you just share it? I'm really interested in how you started looking at what you're looking at. Yeah, I think for me it was um, you, uh, with uh, looking at faith development um, with a critical lens, uh, particularly, and that's that started probably at the beginning of my career and figuring out where it did or didn't fit um, with me and with PLC and with queer and trans folk and where adjustments needed to be made and what the implications were of um, the different theologies and um, um, approaches that we have as queer and trans and gender non-conforming people um, to religion and how that might impact faith development. So I think my journey began with looking at African-American religion and what I had started to call our own sort of African-American religious epistemology. Um, you know, I almost, I, I have this sort of theory or belief that we have our own way of knowing religion, right? That is, um, that looks different in manifestation, but is shared across traditions. And so then taking faith, faith development through that lens and really adapting it and adjusting it. And then as I, um, you know, I had always identified as queer and I knew that I was trans, but I hadn't come out. Um, but after coming out, of course, that was a natural sort of uh, segue into uh, oh, wait, what is this trans faith stuff, you know, and what is what is the implication of trans faith on trans faith development? So when you talk about faith development generally, let's let's, you know, start on the ground floor here. When you are just talking about faith development, who, who are the kinds of people and what are the kinds of theories that you're drawing from? And I'm going to hit mute because I think there's about to be a fire drill here. So if I get real quiet. Great, that's fine. Um, so I think for me, um, it's looking at developmental theories. I'm heavily developmentally based, uh, uh, but the theories, <clears throat> I mean, it's tricky because a lot of these theories were built on uh, developmental psychology, which was um, developed in a vacuum with mostly white, mostly males, um, and um, didn't take uh, into account a lot of indigenous and African-American and other uh, ways of knowing and being. Um, but looking from the uh, sort of developmental perspective of um, how we um, actually grow into uh, mature spiritual beings, uh, that, that is heavily informed my faith development uh, approach and philosophy is heavily informed by Buddhism. Um, and this understanding that there is uh, growth into sort of what we might call enlightenment, but at least it's, it's you know, it's the last stage of James Fowler's um, um, stages of faith, right? It is that full and embodied being that's able to manifest in the world in a way that's helpful and compassionate. Yeah. Jalen, I have been wanting to ask about, and this may be, I don't know if there's things you want to talk about before, but about maybe the ritual of transition for trans folks? Does that, I, I imagine that that would take on a whole different aspect than it would for folks who uh, didn't have that, uh, the com you know, coming out and, and a shift in um, matching who they are with what people see. So can you speak to that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, let me just go through sort of, uh, for me, um, yeah, so I came out, I think it was two years ago, um, more publicly in probably about a year ago. And um, when I um, when I came out, I was still both searching for um, community as far as queer and trans community, but also searching for religious community, a religious home. I mean, I am, you know, a practitioner of Buddhism. Uh, to an extent. <laughs> and I also am, um, uh, had been within Unitarian Universalists, or at least exploring, but definitely working as a religious professional. But neither of them felt like home. Um, neither did the queer community when I was manifesting as or presenting as um, a gay male. But uh, I stepped into the trans community and landed in Seattle and made some connections out of sort of desperation with people of color who lived here. Um, and 
people of color who are trans and gender non-conforming. And what I found was I found more than what was a queer or trans community based on gender and sexuality. What I found was this deeply spiritual community. And these folks who had in isolation and from the margins and in the margins of society developed this um, profound, um, creative and um, unique and deeply authentic spirituality and practice of spirituality together. Um, it was done out of a need for survival, of course, right? Uh, and, and it was also done, I noticed that it's, it's, it's been developed in a, it, with a, mm, a, a sort of connection with ancestral traditions. And I think that that is also born from uh, this desire to make a connection to our families and our ancestors that have often abandoned us. Right, and so I think these rituals of transition, they happen, oftentimes we don't get those rituals, right? When we first come out, what we get is um, lots of loss and grief and letting go, right? That happens when we lose our families and some of us lose our jobs and uh, we lose our friends and we lose um, faith in, in, in our um, religions that we practiced in. And that's not heavily ritualistic. It's just a lot of cutting. And then from that space of not having and not knowing, we find that we need to have something that moves us into something that's a little more joyous and celebratory. So from this space, um, developing rituals for ourselves uh, around transition and even to an extent making our lives, um, uh, building our lives around rituals that actually continually empower us, that continually bring us back in touch with family and ancestry. Um, it's, it's really the heart of our, our of trans faith. Thank you for that question, it's a good question. What has been, um... Have, so from that, what you, because I was, it was really speaking to me, the loss, I think that we, um, we as people, humans, we, we, we have loss and our reaction to loss is maybe part of our spiritual journey, right, is, is how to deal with that. So has there been something that, or, or what, can you speak to what rituals have you found to, I, I almost was picturing like, so I would imagine that a ritual of, um, healing would involve, um, um, I was going to say filling the cup, but that doesn't sound, that's not what I'm trying to say, but um, repair, um, um, you know, how do you find joy after so much loss? Like maybe that's, I'm, I'm maybe not making much sense, but I guess, you know, what comes, what's the ritual that speaks to the emptiness or the loss uh, that, that kind of fills, because if, you know, there's a loss, but then there's a gain of, of, the journey to your whole, toward your whole self, right? And, and authenticity. So what is maybe, maybe authenticity? Yeah, um, I think trans theology is, there is um, at the heart of trans theology, which of course is uh, the theology of the faith of trans people. There's this, um, mm, at the center of it is the understanding that we are actually divinity. Like we are the image of God, right? We are the image of God and that we are the embodiment of mystery, right? If we wanna use that language that we sometimes call God. And we can move beyond the dualities of whatever gender presentations um, uh, that, so, that society tells us we must uh, manifest in. And we can move beyond social expectations and familial expectations and step into something that is much more full. And, transgender and gender non-conforming people have stepped into this brave space oftentimes, even when they haven't changed their presentation, but a brave space to declare themselves as this image of God. And so um, in the midst of this, right, we, I was watching, just do a little, uh, um, an aside for a second, I was watching Sounds True, and it was Van Jones was having a, was talking about sort of the state of our um, society right now and our response as liberals to what's happening politi happening politically um, and et cetera. And that we have lost what they used to call in the African American church the Hallelujah anyhow. Um, this 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 state of dignity and freedom and joy 
that cannot be touched by this world, right? Um, it's like that old African-American spiritual, this, uh, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me, the world didn't give it, and the world didn't take it away, right? And so trans folk, right, live into that. We understand that this image of God is full of joy and fabulousness and fierceness and celebration. And the world can't take it away from us, no matter how much oppression that they place on us or threats of violence or loss or grief. We have decided to step into ourselves as full beings and children of the most divine and children of mystery. So if you, if you would, um, I'm wondering, and Meg, uh, Riley in Boston is there with uh, fire alarms going off, so I'm going to wonder for Meg too. Um, some more about the differences in trans theologies that you see that that go with different identities um, or you know subcategories, especially so uh, gender nonconforming or gender queer theologies. Um, I imagine that trans people of color theologies is is also a a particular subset that you've looked at. Um, so can, can you talk about the different transgender theologies? Um, I may not be able to. So I think there's a certain amount of, um, mm, I mean, I think we share um, a lot, but there are differences between a gender nonconforming um, theology, a transgender theology, and as we know, queer theology, which we're more familiar with and which has actually affected um, at least Unitarian Universalist culture a little bit more, um, in fact, a lot more than uh, trans or gender nonconforming theologies. I think my theology is always going to be informed by my narrative and my story. So it's going to be Black um, and unapologetically Black, right? And it's going to be um, trans binary because I manifest as a trans femme. Um, and so that's the space where uh, my theology comes from. I think that, um, I don't think I would be comfortable speaking to a gender nonconforming um, theology necessarily, but we all do share uh, this um, sense of, uh, the one thing I do see in all of these, and even to an extent in the beginning of queer theology, is there is this uh, theology of uh, non-duality, uh, essentially, right? And what does the non-dual look like? Once you pass um, one set of binaries, you start looking at a lot more binaries, right? You start looking at what's the difference, what's good or bad, right? What is this uh, social expectations versus a pure ethic, right? What is the nature of God in the face of human suffering? And in places like liberal theology where the non-dual um, is less present, um, you know, you see a lot of non-duality in, in Buddhism, even in contemplative Judaism um, and um, Indian traditional religions um, and, and Christianity more than we see in liberal religious faith. It really has sort of uh, become the holder of the non-dual, this, this trans and gender non-conforming theology. And I think it, it would behoove us to step into that space and figure out how our own non-trans and non-gender uh, non non-conforming, uh, non, that's a lot of nons, and non-gender non-conforming uh, faith is affected by um, this uh, move away from whatever these uh, dualities are. One big thing is, um, I was thinking about this, uh, we have this, this gift of, um, like I was saying with Asia, resting in joy, even in the presence of loss. And there are many traditions around the world that spend, um, you know, hundreds of years of conversation and debate about um, how to deal with grief, loss, groundlessness, right? How to deal with um, the realization that towards the end of life, all things will be lost. And we have mastered this right in our life, um, or at least we've entered into this as a full practice in our life. I think that's true for both trans and gender nonconforming folk, right? So moving um, into this place of understanding um, that life becomes more full and there are possibilities that you could never imagine when you let go and are able to rest into a space of not knowing, of groundlessness, of not having, of non-expectation. 
So I'm happy my, my sirens have stopped. And I, I'm so excited and would love to hear you say more about what, how off the binary faith develops and manifests. Because I, I agree with you, there are implications that I think are incredibly life-giving for everybody. Um, and okay, so I'm centering cisgender people there, catching myself at least now, but I'm, I'm really interested in lessons learned and, um, and what you've seen about how that moving off of binaries really does um, shape faith. It seems like it would be just profound. Yeah, I think there's profound implications. I think, you know, as you look at faith development theories, I think you could probably interpret at least a beginning or in its infancy, um, a, a thought about moving away from binaries and a sense of whatever non-duality is and looks like. And, you know, there is in each of these, whether it's Peck or Fowler or whomever, um, each of these theories you see um, sort of in the end, the, the, the mark of spiritual maturity is this ability to deal with paradox, right? And uh, paradox is, right, it, the, the ability to hold these two things is this resting in the space of um, not, not one, not the other, kind of both and not neither either, right? Uh, and um, so for, for people who do this like theologians can do this philosophically or theologically. Um, I think Buddhist philosophy deals a lot with sort of this, uh, I think they call it emptiness, right? This space of uh, paradox of uh, not knowing, but there aren't a lot of cues for how to actually live into this in the world. And I think that we provide an example of how to let go of. Um, trying to think of other practical examples for cis folk around um, faith development and some of the implications. I think within our ability to hold comparative um, theology, comparative religion, so um, interreligious dialogue, our ability to have conversation with, um, I think comparative theology, um, specifically comparative theology requires that we are able to hold, you know, whatever our ethic and faith system is, and then look at this other, this thing that seems different initially, and to step fully into it and to let go of just temporarily, you know, sometimes of whatever our particular faith system is to fully experience the thing. And then from that thing and that experience, you go back to whatever your ethic was, whatever your faith was, and let it grow on you and change your faith specifically. And we have a lot of problems with that, um, um, that approach. Um, and it is quite a mature approach. Um, but, it allowed, but when you see the example of someone who can let go of, to let go of whatever they thought was a social norm or what they thought was the right ethic, the right way of being, and to step into something with bravery to do something different, and you see their success in that, I think that gives us some inspiration and hope that we can do the exact same thing in many other areas of our life, including in interreligious dialogue and comparative theology. A lot of the uh, queer theology that I've studied mm -hmm. um, looks at uh, the power of sort of transgressing societal power structures and transcending them in some ways. Is that something that you've connected with in your work? Are you meaning more sort of the uh, revolutionary liberative aspects of yeah. aspects? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's because the thing is born, right? The faith, the theology um, that we're located in the margins of society, um, you know, naturally everything we can do is revolutionary. Um, and anything that we develop and hold true to ourselves is liberative and has a liberation bent to it. So yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, anytime that I pray, um, it is an act of revolution, right? It is activism. Anytime that I declare myself a minister and say that my ordination is valid and I hold wisdom and truth, that is an act of resistance. Um, anytime we gather as trans community 
um, to connect to our ancestors that have been stolen and taken away from us by our current society and by our families. That is a transcendent act of resistance. And so in some ways, just the act of openly being spiritual in community is, is a revolutionary act. Yeah, gathering community. I mean, I remember I, gave, um, I did a sermon um, about trans faith theology at Woodenville UU Church. And um, I sort of declared it in all trans people and gender nonconforming people as magic, right? <laughs> And I mean, that runs into the problems of, of, of objectifying us in the way, you know, that it's been done with Black folk um, in our efforts to show our uh, beauty and uniqueness, people then start objectifying us. And that wasn't, you know, what I needed. And so there was some resistance to that, resistance to that from um, trans folk. And um, specifically, I was talking about our, um, identities as revolutionaries. And there were, you know, probably in the community, um, a few trans folk and some of them were um, still operating in, you know, relatively uh, binary ways in the world and um, surrounded by cis folk and working with cis folk and making choices about their life and their work based on safety and um, social norms. And you know, here I am declaring them um, without asking them, you know, <laughs> the, declaring them as activists and revolutionaries. And um, we had a conversation about this and it's, it's even, even in the spiritual gathering and in community and stepping into ourselves and declaring ourselves trans. That's what I mean by that, that, that even that is revolutionary. And a lot of us go a step beyond and we actually try to change society, but that's not a requirement for all of us to speak uh, truth to power. Um, it is for those of us who have come out and even those for, of us who have not come out but have realized who we are, it is absolutely necessary that we, um, uh, step into bravery into our identities but you know resistance doesn't always have to look like us um, holding um, a sign standing in front of the state capitol uh, so yeah our gathering is resistance and our resistance also can look quite uh, visible and activist and revolutionary does that make sense it does to me yeah 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 good um i i want i Thank you so much. This is so rich. Um, I have a question about uh, if you if if it would be comfortable for you, I would love for you to speak more to now you're also a religious leader. Um, and you're now uh, trans woman and um, you had other trans folks give you uh, give you feedback that you know this wasn't helpful you know, saying that trans folks are magic or, you know, how we are sermon. So I would love you to, to speak more about your learning as an out trans religious leader and a, B a Buddhist minister and, and some of the things you've learned in that role. Yeah, thank you. So I think the diversity of the experience of um, trans and gender nonconforming people is an ongoing learning. I mean, just because I'm out, you know, I'm a baby, you know, out trans person, right? Um, doesn't mean that I actually understand the nuances of um, how we manifest and um, and why we decide to either present or um, uh, or not present, right? And so I do have learning, um, especially around um, gender nonconformity, um, those identities that are um, outside of myself, including uh, trans men um, and um, intersex folk, right? So just growing in, in, in that way. Um, I think within trans theology um, and trans faith, there is so little work uh, done. You know, there are a number of, um, not a number, maybe a couple of decent um, theologians, um, scholars, and a few, of some writing. So, but it, it honestly feels like that we're starting sort of from the ground up and pulling in what things from um, all of those uh, theologies and faiths that I love, including liberation theology, um, black liberation theology, um, all of those different areas, what in that relates to, you know, my community now and what doesn't? 
and, and, and that is a, that's a learning curve, right? And it means uh, stepping into trying something out and seeing if it resonates with the community or not. Um, we're growing and it's in, in tra trans faith um, and articulation of trans faith and trans theology is in its infancy. So I'm curious because as you said, the faith development theories really rest on the psychological development theories, which were basically white men um, talking about themselves in many ways. And, you know, as I think about Erickson, it sort of starts with trust, right? That you, you start from a place of trust and you move on from there. And I am thinking about, I raised a gender non-conforming kid who was gender non-conforming every minute, they're 22 now. And the trust got really violated when they started presenting in the world. I mean, so um, immediately by age five, three, people were telling them they were wrong and that, you know, telling them they should be different than they were and all kinds of things. And so I wonder, you know, about that, those early developmental pieces, which bleed into the faith development stuff about, um, so there's the resistance and the transgressing and how that intersects with a, a foundational sense of, of trust. And I, I don't know Buddhist psychology well at all. So there may be help there that doesn't come up in the Western psychology. I, um, but anyway, I'm curious what you notice or know about any of these theologies and where kind of a sense of trust comes in. Yeah. I don't know if I have a clear answer. Let me think about um, my own particular narrative is um, and see if something comes from it. Um, my own um, story begins in Mississippi and um, within the African American church and sanctified Pentecostal grandparents as ministers and Baptist parents and very religious uh, home as was um, typical with African American families in the South. And I loved it, right? I love faith, I loved church, I loved um, particularly the sanctified church and, you know, people running around and uh, shouting and it, there was just a whole lot going on, right? <laughs> and so I enjoyed uh, being in that space and um, I knew there was something about religion that um, would probably, I think I understood fairly early that it would be a big part of my life. Um, I thought I received a call to ministry fairly early um, in my life, and um, but it didn't quite work, right? Because here I am in this uh, fundamentalist um, Christian environment that also was black, so there was openness where maybe there wouldn't be in white fundamentalist churches. Um, so I was able to at least operate in that space, but to think of myself as a leader in that space was a little more challenging. Um, I, in that space, was pushed out, right, for being queer and for not necessarily um, identifying with uh, gender norms. And there was a loss of um, hope and there was a loss of faith and there was a loss of trust in that community. Uh, I had experienced what we call baptism in the Holy Ghost, right? where you know you particularly in the black church it looks like you sort of are almost possessed by the holy ghost uh, very much connected to african american i'm sorry african um religion and um and possession but i had this true and real experience that i that i declare you know absolutely right now was 100 percent true right to me that i felt something that something happened to me that it was uh deeply connected to my ancestors but when they pushed me out, right, and, um, uh, and didn't accept me in the church, I started doubting that, right? I started doubting, doubting even that experience and started doubting my faith. Um, and that led to a lot of pain and it led to sort of a stifling of my development into um, my ministry, right? That I had already known that I would would step into and my development of a, a strong faith system. And it created for me a loss um, 
and a, um, a sort of sense of homelessness around faith. Um, and uh, that still, even to an extent, haunts me today uh, because there's a lack of trust in um, institutions to uh, love me and to hold me and to uh, treat me um, honorably. Um, and so now it's hard for me to um, step into um, and let go of and really have faith in particular institutions. And so that created a life of wandering, right? And now I know that wandering is okay, right? Um, uh, to wander uh, is to continually explore and learn about the nature of God and the nature of reality. But for a long time, there was a lot of pain there because it felt like I just had no home. So yeah, I think in that way, this sense of distrust, particularly around faith and faith communities in the beginning, it doesn't allow us to thrive within religious community um, or to settle into or to really trust our religious leaders and our faith systems. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'll shout out to Kitty Carbray, who also was thinking about Eric's trust and mistrust. So, hey. And also to Chuck Hunt, who is talking about having grown up in the Bible Belt in Louisiana and um, in a Black Baptist setting where he often heard judgmental remarks from the pulpit and other people. And, um, you know, just shout out to Chuck for, for keeping on learning and being excited by it. Aisha, you were going to say something. I um uh, we we have a POC group at East Shore uh, Church south of um, where J Reverend Jalen is and Jalen did a POC only uh, worship that we still talk about. It was so um, moving. It was full of music and really connecting us to the spirit. And lots of tears, which was um, compelling and beautiful. And Jalen, I would love for you to speak to like. What would a what would for you a, uh, a an engaging and affirming worship look like? Oh yeah, I mean I think I've thought about this more around um, African American practices, but I think it's probably a, applicable to trans community. I think that for me, I mean, a music, right? The music's gotta be on point. <laughs> I think that's true for queer folk and it's true for black folk and Latinx folk, right? The music needs to be on point. There needs to be a, 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 an ability for us to um, step into spiritual practices that are authentic and speak to us. So leaving a bit of room for creativity around our practices of spirituality. Um, I think um, getting off book and a lot of uh, reading prayers from, you know, the Bible or reading prayers from, you know, poetry books that doesn't work, but really deeply connecting to prayer in a more authentic way, right? I think our prayers need to be authentically spoken and from the heart. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it needs to be focused around liberation because that is our life. Um, and in all things that we do, it's about looking for safety for ourselves and safety for others. So, you know, navel gazing just is not going to work in any of our worship services or not, and not in our sermons and not in our worship, none of it, right? Um, if we are leaving there feeling more empowered and safe, then that's a good worship service. If we're leaving there with tools to empower and provide safety to other transgender non-conforming people, then that's a good worship service for us. Um, because honestly, um, with the threat of violence and the fear of walking into a grocery store and being harassed and the fear of uh, not having a bathroom to go to because honestly we just don't have time for anything else we have we we feel liberation uh, the need for liberation is uh, now and urgent and um, needs to be at the top of our list in conversations in worship and in organization thank you 
Well, you said at the end in worship and in organization. So I'd love to extend that question beyond worship in UU congregations specifically, you've served three of them. What do you think would create a more liberative environment for trans and gender nonconforming people? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I, I, I think particularly around um, the inclusion of black folk, it had always been in my heart that we just hadn't gotten there yet. Like, and it's not that there are some decent intentions. And of course, there's a lot of ignorance and um, resistance that plays a part in us not getting there. But there's this lack of um, devotion and dedication to the thing. And to, like, it's okay for us to do inclusion if it means that we boost the visibility of POC or not congregations so that we look good or so that we feel a little good about ourselves or even so it helps one or two people but to adjust um, our culture to let blackness um, change our culture is something that we're just not committed to or dedicated to because that requires us to change everything that requires to change all things that we understand about um, uh, social norms, what is right and what is wrong, where what worship should look like, uh, how my needs are met or not met. I think it's the same for trans folk. I think that we need a radical shift in um, the minds of uh, cisgender, mostly white folk, uh, to allow transness and all of its magic and beauty to actually affect their culture and their mindsets their mindsets, to allow themselves to be completely transformed and changed, to be willing to let go of those things that actually um, no longer serve um, a more expansive view of gender or race, right? Um, it's really interesting, this is sort of uh, uh, an aside, but it is interesting that a lot of the needs of trans folk do intersect quite well with the needs of uh, black folk and other uh, people of color. Uh, so it's not like working. I know a lot of us are like, well, we've been working on the black stuff, you know? So we haven't had time for the trans stuff. It's like, no, if you make it welcoming and comfortable for black people, you will have opened up space uh, for trans persons also um, in that. So it's not a separate dedication. I think there's a number of things that we can, we can do. First of all, is to change that that mindset that church and community is about our own comfort. I mean, we do all go because we need to be lifted and inspired, but we need to grow into understanding that lifting and inspiration comes from the work that we do in lifting and inspiring others. And really just, I mean, I know this sounds cliche, but we haven't lived into that. And so um, that, it's that it requires a little bit of shifting and a dedication to empower trans leaders and to empower black leaders. And what does that empowerment look, look like? Well, maybe it means that we don't do um, a second or third uh, mortgage reduction campaign, or maybe it means that we change our priorities um, to actually fund and pay, um, put our money where our mouth is and pay for uh, leadership training for our trans congregants and other trans folks who are, who are um, in ministry, understanding that trans persons have some um, very difficult finances around medical transition often. And um, that if we understood that trans folk held this power of divinity um, and this ability to teach us about non-duality, then we would change our priorities and empower those people to be our leaders. That means putting our money where our mouth is. That means making sure that we have support for current trans leaders. That means investing in trust. That means um, actually bringing people in, paying for people, consultants who know what they're doing to come into our organizations and congregations and figure out what the, 
where we need to change as an organization to be accepting and welcoming for trans and gender nonconforming people. Maybe it means you make a dedication to yourself that we will have a trans minister. Like we are dedicated to have a trans minister. What do we do with our culture? What do we need to do to train these people to make sure that we have enough trans ministers in the, in the pool of hiring? What do we do to get ourselves to that place? There's a certain level of dedication onto this that is required and it takes conviction and that conviction comes from seeing our divinity um, and from opening ourselves to learning from trans and gender nonconforming people. And also realizing that we are incomplete right now, that we are incomplete as a people when yes. we don't uh, recognize that, that there's a big part of who we are as humans that's missing when we only focus on one uh, really right now, the dominant culture and the needs of that group. And so that, that's the part that I would love to communicate to people is right now we're, we're, we are not whole as a Unitarian Universalist people, even a little bit. And we are missing a big part of what it is to be human when we don't make the commitment to everything you just said, Jalen. And so um, to me, it's, it's really saying to folks who think that, that they're, you know, I, I gave, I've been giving workshops lately quite a bit. And, and when I said to, I was at a UU church in the area and I said, there are plenty, country, plenty of country clubs for white people. Unitarian yeah. Universalism does not need to be that. Nope. Uh, there is nothing, there's nothing there. That is not a religious faith. That is not, um, it, it's not a spiritual community and we need to stop doing that. We do. And, and um, I think we, we, what I would love to, my, my wish is that we understand we are, we are missing, we are missing so much of what it means to be human and, and spiritual and whole when we don't um, recognize our siblings and spirit or trans uh, folk and especially trans women who are, you know, uh, black trans women. Um, and, and so, that, you know, I wanna be whole, I'm gonna work towards wholeness. And I know that there is so much lacking in, in where we are currently as you, you use. When we get that, um... You know, I could see, you know, prophetically in my, in the, in the sort of prophetic uh, eyes of hope that we would, we would make a dedication to, or Unitarian Universalists would dedicate themselves to hiring, um, to, uh, to having the most and highest paid Black trans women in any organization, right? They could actually make that commitment and figure out how to do that, right? When they actually are convicted by faith that they are actually missing something. That's exactly what will happen. I'm thinking about the blue worship um, that happened um, in, uh, where were we, in Kansas City, and how absolutely powerful that worship was when Blackness was centered, um, and how it was very Unitarian Universalist, and how revolutionary and radical it was, and how it was all those things that we had hoped for, um, but so much had been left out that they, we were missing that in worship. And I guarantee you, a lot of white folks who were in there would have absolutely felt completely fulfilled at that service, but they're missing it because they didn't open themselves to it. It's the same with trans folk. When I do trans worship with some of my um, siblings here, there is, it's a different quality than the blue worship. Um, there is a depth of, and a profundity and um, sort of baptism in the, um, in the mother lineage, right? That exists within trans communities, uh, this deep and powerful and unique connection that's, that is universal to all people. It could actually apply to all people, but it requires a centering of transness, trans faith and trans theology in the work that we do. Um, and so, yeah, you're missing it, you're missing it. I don't know many cis folk who have ever experienced or seen that space, right? And so they have missed a religious experience. And I wanna shout out to Kia Amin, who was on The View last week uh, from Black Lives of Unitarian Universalism, says, and black folks who come to our faith are not looking for that. We, we're looking for a country club. We want deep theology engage, and engagement. We do not want a country club, amen. Amen, honey, amen, amen. Hmm. This is a little bit switching topic, but we're coming towards the end. And I, and so it's, you might say, no, I don't want to talk about that. But I am curious. 
um, with what is going on with these hearings and with all of the language about violence against women right now. I feel like Black trans women have really particular voices to add, which I'm, I'm not hearing a lot um, right now, but I, I wondered if you um, have a particular perspective that you feel like is not being widely shared that you'd like to. And if you if you didn't come to talk about that, obviously pass, <laughs> but I'm really, I'm curious what you are saying to yourself and your kin right now. Yeah. Um... I mean, as you know, the highest rate of um, murder in this country as a percentage of the population is Black trans women. And um, the threat of, um, of violence is real. And that's just, you know, that's murder. We're not talking about ongoing harassment, um, underemployment, um, the, the risks that we have to take, um, you know, when doing sex work. Um, and, um, the gaslighting that comes from our family and our congregations that we work at or employers that we work with. Um, and actual sexual violence that happens to us. Um, I have, you know, spent um, a lot of time even before coming out with, you know, trans and um, mostly trans, uh, black trans folk and trans women. And I, it's rare that I meet one of those people who have not experienced um, sexual violence. I mean, it honestly is rare among women, um, but it is even rarer among trans women. And no, um, we're not being talked about, of course, we never are um, in this moment. And, you know, to an extent, there's this feeling that we're asking for it because we have actually stepped out of the side of social norms. Um, because our divinity is not seen, because we don't fit in the binary, we sort of deserve it. Um, and it is a space that I think we are getting used to. And to an extent, I'm training myself how to actually be in this space and accept it as a, as a given. Um, and that said, you know, how do I have to present? What do I have to do? How must I speak? How must I carry myself to buy milk at a grocery store so that I'm not hurt or abused? Um, yeah, I think um, it's high time that I, I can't expect, I don't expect politicians nor um, most cisgender society to speak to our goodness and our rights to be free from abuse. But I do expect faith communities to be doing that right now. I do expect very vocal faith communities standing up for trans black women right now and putting them at the top of the list of the work that they're doing in the world. And even in this moment, in this Me Too moment, um, to acknowledge that we have not been represented in it, not at all. Ain't, ain't we women? Ain't I a woman? Yes, I am. And I deserve the same attention, right? And the same, the same acknowledgement of my humanity and right, human right to be free of violence as any woman. Yeah, thank you. It is, it has been, uh, the absence has been profound to me in, in the, the narrative right now. Uh, because because of what you say. So thank you for that. Um, we are finishing up our time. Jalen, there's so much that we could have talked to you about. And I, I wonder if there are things that we didn't get to that you really would like to share. Um, you kind of skirted around. Um, I, I'm curious if you wanted to say more about the Buddhist meditation practice that you're doing and what that offers, or just if there are things that we didn't um, didn't get to. Yeah, so I mean, you can check me out on, um, on my website is growing. <laughs> so don't be don't judge me. Um, it's mutualitymovement.org. Um, it had been up and I've changed it around just uh, to make myself available for speaking events and consulting um, and etc. Um, I my 
my Buddhist practice is growing and my sort of stepping away from traditional Buddhism and growing into something that's a little more relevant to trans and black people. Uh, so I will be offering more and keeping, um, keeping everything updated on that website. I, I just, um, my hope, my hope is that we start to acknowledge um, that particularly in Unitarian Universalism that we have not been treating trans folk right as much as we think we have. We've done okay with LGB, mm, B maybe a little less so, but absolutely not well at all with T. Where, what are the stories? Where are our stories um, of being treated um, horribly within Unitarian Universalism? They exist, I've heard them. I'm starting to listen to those fine, and be convicted um, and shift our ways. So yeah, that would be my hope. Can you say the website again so we can uh, offer it to people? Yeah, I'll type it in. It's mutualitymovement.org, mutualitymovement.org. And I like work, so you can contact me and book me to do stuff. And thanks to those who watched live and, and participated today. We didn't get to everything, but you can check out the website. It's been really, really educational. I appreciate it. I, I feel like you've given me a whole lot to think about today. So um, thank you so much. And next week, we'll have the Commission on Institutional Change here. I think the whole commission, is that correct? I can't, Aisha, have you been talking to them? Are they all coming? Uh, yes, actually, they're, yes, they're all going to be together. Um, I actually may be there because I'm going to be in San Francisco, but I'm not sure if I'll, if, yeah, so I may be actually with them in the room, however it's going to work, but I believe they're all get, planning on being there. I, mind you, I have no idea. I haven't communicated with them. I'm just guessing. <laughs> well, that's fabulous. So yeah, that'll be Leslie Takahashi, Caitlin Breedlove, Mary Byron, Duro Farrar, Natalie Fenimore, Elias Ortega Aponte, and hey, that's gonna be exciting. So um, yeah, wonderful. Again, thank you so much, Reverend Jalene Scott, for your ministry, for all that you're bringing to the movement and for your vision of where we could go and become a really um, who we say we want to be. I love your word convicted. I, I, I stand uh, in, in that word or I, I live I'm going to live with, I'm going to live with that word this week and really look at where I'm convicted and where I need more conviction. So thank you very much. I feel so. Thank you. All right. Take care all.